Good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to today's webinar, Super Aggregation in the Cloud, the Future of Video Distribution, hosted by Digital TV Europe and sponsored by TiVo. I'm Stuart Thompson, I'm the editor of Digital TV Europe. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to explain how you can participate in today's session. First, if you have any technical difficulties during the session, please press the help button on your player console to receive assistance in solving some common issues. We welcome questions. In order to submit those to today's participants, simply type them into the window on the left-hand side of your screen and hit the submit button. We'll be answering questions offline for this session, so please feel free to send them in and we'll get back to you as soon as possible after the session ends. If at any time you're having audio difficulties or experiencing difficulty seeing the slides advance, simply hit the F5 key to refresh your webcast console. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and it will be available on the Digital TV Europe website from tomorrow for you to review. And you'll be notified by email when it's uh, in our archive. I'd like to begin by introducing today's uh, participants, today's presenters. We have Liam Bresnan, who's VP of Product PTV at TiVo. Um, Liam has more than 15 years of experience in product management and technology. He leads TiVo's PTV product management team to define and deliver award-winning products and partnerships for pay TV operators globally. And previously, he worked with Ericsson and Microsoft, where he was responsible for solution architecture in EMEA, focused on the media room, media room reach, and media first products. We also have Kedar Mohite, who's principal consultant Omdia. Working in Omdia's media delivery practice, Kedar has followed media technology and ICT service developments across broadcasters, digital service providers, sports franchises, and the OTT publishing and enterprise video segments with a focus on upstream and downstream content supply chain technologies across linear and non-linear TV and video workflows. And it's to Kedar that we're going to turn first for a summary of his own thoughts on today's topic. So Kedar, please uh, take it away with your presentation. Thank you, Stuart. Before we get into the presentation and the keynote, the core message foundation is moving around how cloud play a pivotal role in IPTV platform owners journey towards a robust and scalable super aggregation model or what we term uh, in OMDI's viewpoint is a single entertainment hub for every digital user. The structure of this keynote encompasses what is the roadmap towards creating a single entertainment hub as a service per digital user and what are the eminent drivers to this change? How is this transformation journey changing the business priorities within the next two to three years for IPTV platform owners? And finally, how an agile, scalable backbone is essential to meet this requirement? Uh, I just want to reiterate that cloud or scalable backbone is just a starting point and lies at the epicenter of this transformation. We at OMDI devised this transformation journey into four main waves and not to neglect the fact that as per our ICTOI survey 2020-2021, almost 58% of IPTV platform owners plan to embark on this journey in the future. So now if, if we look at the first wave of OTT bundling, it was primarily focused around tier one brands such as Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus. Our OTT video bundling deals and services tracker highlight that tier one international brand deals or partnerships in 2016 remained at 83%, while this has now reduced to 69% in past five years. In, this, in, in the wave, which we term as 1.5, majority of the IPTV or DSPs are focusing on short form content repositories and localization, resulting into bundling of tier two and tier three OTT uh, OTT TV services globally. The OTT video bundling tracker again highlights that these localized partnerships have increased to 31% of the total deals signed in 2020 and stipulated to rise further for differentiation of the overall super aggregation ecosystem. Furthermore, at OMDI, we believe that the next wave, which we term as 2.0, will witness bundling of digital services beyond video. That is music, gambling, gaming, betting, uh, to accelerate our pause and our which is your average revenue per user and average revenue per advertiser, if it's an uh, award service. Now these bundling will again 
be with primarily be with tier one services globally or regionally, and absolutely will have less local essence to that. Finally, the last wave of this entire IPTV transformation journey towards a super aggregation model or creating a single entertainment hub will witness most of these platforms focusing on building long tail uh, engagement and retention rates um, based tier two and tier three bundling of localized entertainment services beyond video. Now, as, as these IPTV platform owners absolutely embrace, uh, embrace these waves, the four main factors, those are driving or needing uh, or to be, uh, to be basically embraced by IPTV platform owners or who are basically pushing them towards embracing this transformation journey are basically social networks bec becoming key media consumption platforms, demand for short form content, including news, trailers, teasers, mini clips, et cetera, are on the rise due to lowering of millennials and generations at attention thresholds to less than 15 seconds per, per browse. And finally, not all can be Netflix and Amazon and Disney's of the world to continue spend on premium media assets like tier one sports leagues, uh, sports, uh, sports rights and, and uh, sports rights and live uh, concerts as profitability margins come under pressure along with consumption lifespan of these assets is also shortening. Now looking at how business priorities are changing to meet this goal of single entertainment hub as a service, Omdia's ICTOI survey 2020-2021, which we've conducted in October, 2020, highlights that unification of content supply chain, both linear and non-linear automation and hybrid monetization remain top three priorities in the next three to four years within the super aggregation ecosystem. Almost 50% highlight that unified content supply chain is important 45% reveal that hybrid monetization avenues to lower churn and safeguard profitability is key in, in this space, while automation and orchestration to meet changing business requirements hold as one of the core essence too. Finally, we believe that agile and scalable backbone is essential in embarking on this journey. Although one size fits all won't work in, the, in this case due to individual IPTV platform owners diverse budgets, existing legacy system configuration, et cetera, will play a pivotal role. But Omdia believes that pushing workloads on public cloud due to time to market as the key KPI and differentiator will see an uptake along with private cloud infrastructure. F fear of loss of control, but still demand demanding agility will drive the adoption of private cloud. Finally, it, 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 it is not just an agile backbone, but building a unified search discovery and UI and UX across multiple devices, platforms is necessary to succeed in building a single entertainment hub as a service on long-term basis. Thank you and over to you, Stuart. Thanks very much, Keda. Um, I'm now going to follow up with um, some of the findings from the Digital TV Europe annual survey that we carry out uh, each year. And uh, one of the key topics we, we covered this year was on the cloud and how it feeds into super aggregation. So to begin, IPT service providers are moving towards a super aggregation model focused on aggregating third party services in addition to or instead of marketing their own pay TV packages. They can offer a wide range of services catered to new consumption patterns in place of their strengths, which are connectivity and the user experience. Those IPTV providers are also under quite a lot of pressure now to optimize the delivery infrastructure, not only to manage costs more efficiently, but also to enable them to shift to that super aggregation model. Um, and to do that, they're increasingly adopting cloud technology, which can provide a more efficient, scalable way of delivering content to end users. Now, we surveyed over 200 industry executives um, between December and January uh, and asked them about a range of topics, including this one. And we're, I'm now going to show you some of the findings we, we drew from that survey. So the first question we asked um, in relation to this is, how will IPTV evolve in the future? 
Now, modern video delivery systems are converging on IP, as we know. However, the extent to which um, IPT video delivery should itself move to the cloud still divides opinion to some extent. We asked survey respondents to give a view on how far and how fast IPTV um, systems will migrate from on-premises infrastructure to the cloud, and most of them broadly accept that cloud represents the future of, uh, of video. Majority believe that most IPTV networks will become entirely cloud-based in the future. There's some differences of opinion about the time scale. You have 19% who believe networks will be entirely cloud-based in two or three years, and then a slightly larger group, 39%, believe it'll take a bit longer with hybrid cloud and on-premises based systems being more common for some time. There are also some skeptics, two and five believe IPTV operators will adopt cloud, but for some and not all applications, the hybrid will really be the rule. And then a very small group, 2%, um, are much more cloud skeptic and think that um, there'll be relatively little adopt adoption of cloud technology. And I think that's really an outlier. The key takeaway really is that IP distribution networks are moving to the cloud, but there are differences of opinion about how fast and how complete that transition is going to be. Now, we also asked what impact uh, the COVID-19 crisis will have on the pace of adoption of cloud technology. This is obviously still a, a very current topic um, and ongoing, having a, a huge impact on uh, the video business generally and on accelerating the adoption of certain technologies. So I would say the pandemic has seen a shift to streaming, obviously, by consumers, uh, which is that's widely known, and that will have an impact on the way service providers manage the video delivery. And more broadly, the pandemic seen a rise in cloud spending by enterprises, which I guess um, that also is likely to have an onward impact on the economies of scale and innovation in, in cloud technology. But among the respondents to our survey, so a third of respondents believe that COVID-19 will vastly accelerate the adoption of cloud technology by uh, service providers, while a further 44% believe the pandemic will result in a moderate acceleration of cloud adoption. Only a minority um, are of the view that it will have little or no impact. So the key takeaway really there is COVID-19 will accelerate the adoption of cloud technology by IPTV service providers. So the main drivers of migration to cloud-based delivery for IPTV service providers, and in this chart and some of the ones that follows, the dark blue band that you can see on the left there shows how many respondents thought this particular driver was very important. Then the light blue, moderately important, green, not very important, down to orange, which means not at all important. And in the view of survey respondents, really, we asked them, as you can see, about quite a wide range of factors, probably too many to, to take in here, but uh, two really stand out at the top. Um, one is the fact that cloud-based delivery can enable service providers to scale resources up and down quickly in response to shifts in demand. Um, and also the way in which it enables them more easily to take on the role of super aggregators of third-party content. So four out of five respondents believe scalability of cloud-based video is very important or moderately important as a driver uh, of adoption of cloud. And then similar numbers of respondents believe in the importance of cloud as an enabler of the uh, of the aggregation model for service providers. And then there were a bunch of other factors that come in, often related. You've got you know um, the need to compete with OTT streamers, related need to be able to launch new services and features quickly, growth in multi-screen, cutting costs such as set-top boxes, which is also quite important, offering services more easily outside of fixed network areas. Uh, and then moves from linear to on-demand consumption and also QOE. But really the, the key ones are, are scalability and getting to that super aggregation plane. So what features then are important for IPTV service providers in today's market? Again, here the dark blue shows how many respondents think something is absolutely essential, mid blue, very important, green, moderately important, orange, not very important, and then that very bright blue band at the end, not at all important. Uh, survey respondents gave the high scores to aggregation of multiple streaming apps and to the related feature of universal search across those multiple apps and content sources. 
and then access to curated selection of premium sports movies and series and linear TV channels and so on, which are really the more traditional mainstay of pay TV services. That came next, that came sort of third in the, in the list. And then those traditional pay TV features were closely really followed in importance by universal content recommendation as a feature. Um, and that again across multiple apps and content sources. So again, that's closely associated with the, the kind of super aggregation model that we're talking about here. And then further down the list, you've got DVR, which is something that's obviously declining in importance perhaps as on-demand consumption rises. Um, and then down there, perhaps at the end, you've got voice search, which is on the up. And I think it's important, although it's at the end of that list, it's still seen as something that's uh, important, although perhaps by the respondents to the survey, still a nice to have rather than an essential element. Really aggregation of multiple apps is, is the king and then universal set, search sits alongside that as a key, key driver. So should IPTV and other service providers aspire to be super, super aggregators in the first place? Um, we asked this to a response and an absolute majority of them, 56%, um, said that they should, um, with perhaps the caveat that super aggregation means aggregating content from OTT applications and broadcast in a single user experience for all sources. That's a very important element of an effective super aggregation play. And then you've got a smaller group uh, under a third taking the view that um, service providers should be super aggregators with individual OTT apps and broadcast content prevented, presented as they will in, in different user experiences perhaps for each content source, you don't need to, to provide that unified thing, but the, the majority believe in the unified experience is a key element of that. So moving on to uh, search and recommendation, how important is universal search and recommendation to, to this model? If we drill down a bit further into views about that, um, over three quarters of our survey respondents rated this as a very important element. 21% uh, think that universal search and recommendation is the single most important element of the super aggregator model, in fact, and then uh, a broader group, an absolute majority, 55%, um, beyond the 21%, believe that it's a very important element of, of the model. So universal search and recommendation really is a very important part of the super aggregator proposition. And then the final question we asked, in this um, part of the survey was, what are your what are the main challenges facing operators seeking to adopt cloud-based delivery, which as we know is an enabler of this model. Um, and we already saw there were differences of opinion among respondents about how far and how fast IPC, IPTV providers are likely to embrace the cloud. We asked them to rate five key challenges. And to be honest, most were rated pretty similarly in terms of importance. Um, I think if you pick one out, the single most pressing challenge in the view of our sample really, then the one that resonates is that cloud de delivery is not really optimized for live linear channels, live linear channel delivery, still some challenges there. And however efficient it might be in theory to deliver everything from the cloud, there's still a perception that delivery of live linear channels is managed more efficiently using one-to-many broadcast technology. Um, and then the same applies to large scale live event coverage, which really sits along, alongside that. So really the big challenge to cloud is arguably not the most efficient way to deliver live linear channels and live event coverage. So to summarize, um, we can see that IPT service providers are adopting cloud technology. There's some differences about how far and how fast that, that's happening. Challenges include how to deliver live linear channels and events at scale as we've just seen. The benefits um, of the cloud include scalability according to demand and the ability, crucially, to aggregate content from multiple sources more easily. Uh, cloud technology can enable the super aggregator model with that unified UX, including universal content discovery. And that universal content discovery is the key USP for the super aggregator model. So with that, I'm going to um, bring in Liam to discuss some of this in a bit more uh, depth. Uh, so Liam, you've heard what, what the results of the survey were. What do you see as the main drivers yourself of, of migration to cloud-based delivery for IPTV operators? 
and to what extent do the survey findings really match what you're seeing happening in the, in the market on that? Yeah. Uh, hi, Stuart, and hi, everybody that's listening and, and watching. Um, I appreciate your time to talk to you all. Uh, it, the, the, the survey that, uh, that you went through just now is, is incredibly interesting, incredibly important, um, and something we see uh, mirrored on, on the, uh, in the data that we have available as well. Um, so uh, it, it is something that, is, uh, uh, that we know is driving the industri industry, super aggregation and, and cloud is driving the industry in general. And it actually has been driving, uh, driving our perspective on the industry inside of TiVo uh, for some quite considerable period of time. Um, that has uh, been borne out in our data, which I'll take some, a, a, a little bit of a walk through in, in some capacity, um, but also is borne out in the consumer experiences that we ship as, as TiVo today, where you can see super aggregation and cloud usage built in from, from day one. Um, so yes, uh, very important, um, something we believe in wholeheartedly, and, uh, and, and we're really looking forward to talking about it with you all. Great, and, and we saw that super aggregation in the cloud really sit side by side there. And for you, why does that super aggregation model now really make sense for service provider? The slide that I have on the screen here really demonstrates the main driver and the main answer to your question, uh, and that is that Individual consumers now are not just subscribing to their pay TV service to provide them access to video. They're providing, they're, they're subscribing to their pay TV service. They're subscribing to Netflix. They're subscribing to Prime Video. You know, they're subscribing to, at least based on the information that we have inside of our TiVo Trends report, um, as of Q2 2021, nearly nine services per consumer, uh, generally that's kind of per household. And when you consider that that's in, in a lot of cases, nine separate applications that a consumer has access to, that's a huge amount of uh, content that they have access to. And it also takes a lot of work to discover all of that content. So super aggregation for us is, a, is, is table stakes for um, a consumer's optimized experience because it will help them get out of that uh, requirement to dive into one app, maybe not find what they want, dive into another another app, maybe not find what they want there, and to continue to, to have to look for, for content over multiple sources. Having a super aggregated model, which in our opinion includes not just the OTT applications, but also the live linear TV as well. So whether it be coming from live TV, whether it coming from start over catch up, whether it be coming from network DVR, or even the uh, video providers, video on demand library, either you know AVOD, TVOD, or SVOD, um, is all surfaced, should all be surfaced throughout the UI UX as first party citizens. Uh, the consumer should have control over what they see. Uh, if they don't, for instance, subscri subscribe to one OTT service than another, they should have the ability to, to trim those out. But giving them that ability inside of a single user experience is, is highly impactful for their own satisfaction with the pay TV um, experience and ultimately uh, you know, pays dividends throughout the, the, their uh, consumption of consumer video. Great, yeah, and it's obvious, I think, that the pay TV operators are, are taking this on board and there's a massive movement towards the super aggregation model. But it's interesting from, from the data you brought out there, I mean, the number of, of services that, that people are taking has, has grown massively and there's a certain fragmentation that, that goes along with that. So. Absolutely. When you look at the, that traditional PTV landscape and the, and the competitive landscape that those operators now face, how profoundly do you think that has changed and how significant now are the challenges they face in evolving their business model away from what they've traditionally done to, towards this kind of new uh, experience? Yeah, uh, the, the pay TV operators um, have a, a stark difference between what they used, to, how they used to compete and how they have to compete now. Um, when you consider that the majority 
of uh, you know large tech, uh, tech, uh, tech companies have some kind of OTT experience, some kind of ability to get to provide you access to content. Um, the obviously the large broadcast networks have those abilities and have had those abilities for some period of time. The explosion of content is is I think you know bigger than we've ever seen before. Um, I, I won't use the phrase golden age of content because I think that uh, quite honestly it's uh, until we get the next golden age of content. I, I, I've never been. Um, it's never failed to impress me how much content we as a, as a as a planet can produce and I foresee that growing and growing and growing um, and so when you when you consider that that content will continue to grow um, whether it comes from broadcasters whether it comes from OTT operators whether it comes from you know individuals uh, uh, and and more short form content we know that having uh, giving the pay TV operator the ability to sort through that content and provide the content that is most relevant to that user at that particular time on that particular device is a key value prop of the pay TV, um, the pay TV uh, service that they provide. Um, that will enable them to compete with these large uh, video solutions, no matter where they come from, um, because uh, of course the the OTC solutions generally are very concerned with with uh, you know their content. They want to make sure their content is the one that's watched. They want to drive their own engagement numbers up. That is, uh, in actuality, you know, not the greatest consumer experience. Because if I can't find my uh, piece of content on one OTT app, and I should be able to quite easily and freely bounce to another OTT app that does have relevant content for me at that time. And so we're incentivized to put the consumer experience together that enables consumers to do what they do what they want, as opposed to being, you know, pulled into the engagement model of one single provider versus another. Right, and I think you. I mean, looking at the that competitive landscape, I think you also have some data on on what's driving cancellation of, of pay TV services. Absolutely, it's something yeah. that illustrates that. Then that is exactly the uh, the the data that you're you're mentioning as well. Um, so we kind of came at this from from two angles. We we looked at uh, really, you know, what do the the previous slide was around what the uh, consumer has access to. This is the, the view of the world on why consumers decide to cancel a pay TV service. And you consider that the, you know, the, the large uh, amount of responses to this is, it's just too expensive for me. Um, you know, that's gonna be the case uh, for, um, it has been the case for a long period of time and, and will continue to be the case that price is a huge driver to what consumers want to do and, and where they place their dollars. Um, the, the, the ones that are really interesting are, are really, if you look at that second one down, I switched to a video, a, a streaming video service. You know, that was a long way away in the past. And we're now seeing direct competition from switching to streaming video services, especially in, uh, in, uh, geographies such as the U S where, uh, streaming video services really can provide a, um, a comparable threat to pay TV operators. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of consumers become those cord cutter, cord never um, uh, demographic users that um, uh, that we've talked about in the past. And so, between you know having a competitive a competitively priced solution that might or might not include super aggregated video, as well as giving them the ability to consume that video uh, inside of that experience, that is one of the reasons we truly believe that uh, super aggregation and by extension, you know, the cloud uh, nature of that super aggregation is key to consumer experiences going forward. Right, absolutely. And, and you can, you know, the, that switching to streaming services, it's both a challenge and an opportunity, obviously, for, for these, these operators. Yeah, and absolutely. Now, Liam, you've talked a little bit already, I guess, about what that super aggregation play actually means. But if you had to distill it down, what do you think it really means in practice for operators? What are the essential elements of a super aggregation proposition? 
Yeah, the super aggregation is hard. Um, I, I don't have necessarily a uh, a slide to talk to to this, but uh, I will give you my my thoughts on it in in creating this in the way that we have uh, inside of the TiVo product and and other products inside of the Xperi uh, family. Um, super aggregation is is a very challenging thing to do. Uh, as I mentioned, content is exploding. Uh, we have content from you know. Uh, many, many OTT services, often exclusive to those OTT services as well, which is um, which drives uh, the need to ingest uh, content from all of the OTT services that are available. So whether it's coming from Netflix, whether it's coming from Prime Video, whether it's coming from DAZN, whether it's coming from Craze, you know, all of these, all of these places. Uh, it, 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 we we need to have access to that content to be able to surface it within uh, the wider UI UX. Um, then you need to make sense of it all. You've got all of that data. How do you make sense of it all? You need to you need to be able to rationalize that data. You need to be able to know that this piece of content from one OTT source or from the pay TV source is the same as the content from another OTT source. And that's hard. So you need to make sure that it's unique. You need to make sure that uh, we're counting all correctly. Uh, and, and then you need to make sure that you're matching all of that content with the bright, beautiful, immersive box art, the descriptive metadata, you know, all of those things that as a consumer, I sit there and when I'm looking for content, I'm, you know, I'm often attracted by the Hey, I know that brand, or I I know that you know I know the name of that movie, or those kind of things that uh, uh, that enable a a, uh, a set of downstream uh, capabilities. Um, and then, at least on our side, we like to marry that with um, uh, advanced search and recommendation. And by that, I mean aggregated, unified advanced search and recommendations. So. That means that within um, a particular experience, I can provide a consumer with aggregated uh, recommendations, no matter where the content comes from. So if I think that you'll like the latest and greatest Netflix show, because that's quite like a lot of the shows that you consume, um, then I can do that uh, because it's, it's aggregated on top. If I think that uh, you know there might be a, a piece of content on a service that you have access to but you don't often use, I can surface that to to the consumer um, in a in a smart and friendly way. I can do that based on a pure recommendation as well as a prediction. So the difference being that a recommendation is, hey, you think you might like this, and a prediction being uh, being that, uh, hey, we know you sit down at six p.m. each night and you watch the news on this on this set top box. I can make those kind of determinations between the two. And I can also help the user that when they want to look for something specific, they don't need to do that deep dive into each application. They can do a unified search at the top and they can pull out all of the places that that piece of content exists. So that's really powerful from a consumer perspective. Um, the other side that we need to marry that with is the delightful user experience. So a consumer user experience that is easy to use, is simple, uh, enables the consumer a lot of understanding and information, but doesn't hide that behind complexity, is something that requires a great deal of uh, understanding, appreciation, uh, user research, you know, time, effort. Uh, and that's where we've obviously spent a lot of time on the TiVo side as well. So. Uh, in summary, to create a, uh, a fully aggregated, um, uh, cloud-capable uh, super aggregation story is, is not simple. Um, uh, it's, it definitely requires many, many steps and, and many, many requirements, um, but the payoff is, is uh, hopefully significant at the other end. Right, and I think it comes across from what you just said. That obviously, one of the keys is, is, is putting the the content in front of the consumer in a way that makes sense for them, because the more the more that's aggregated, right. the more there is to to find. The more there is, the more difficult it is to find perhaps that exactly. gems that you might you might want to watch. So when you look at those content discovery tools, how to how for you 
do those play a key role in keeping customers engaged with the service and how important is that universal search and discovery to the, yeah. the overall proposition and, and you know solving those consumer pain points so this slide really demonstrates uh some of the answer to your question um we know that when a super aggregated model is not used uh, or an aggregated model even is not used, consumers have real pain points with those services. So within the survey uh, uh, that, that we ran, we really asked a lot of questions around what those pain points are when they, when they don't have those, um, the aggregated content there. Obviously you can see that they're the top complaint really is it's just hard to find good content so 60 percent of consumers find it hard to find good content in a day and age where we have more content available than than ever before it shouldn't be hard for us to find content um, we we totally do agree that there is a, a level of content fatigue with uh, with going through this but you know, we should have fantastic content that is available for almost any niche to be able to, uh, to consume. Um, the other side is, say I know what content I want to watch. Well, what service has it? That's really difficult. Uh, you know, if if you're trying to watch a newly released movie just out of uh, just out of the theatre window and into into the VOD catalogues. You know, what service has it ended up on? Did it end up on Prime Video? Did Netflix grab it? Did, you know, is there some other premium based content that I need to, I need to go figure out? You know, that's, that's really frustrating for a consumer to know what they want to watch and just not know how to get there to be able to, to, to watch it. Um, the, the other side, and this harks back to the previous slide, um, is really around cost. So we know that consumers are, actively thinking about how they manage their own costs. Um, I'll talk in, in a little while around what we also believe are key parts of the pay TV, um, uh, a, a good pay TV experience, but accounting for cost is, is a significant part of that. Um, and so that then, you know, uh, drips down into the, the response after that, which is, you know, there's just too many video services. So, uh, the user experience that we build at, here at TiVo and the user experience that we really believe in is giving the user the ability to have these choices and to see these, this piece of content no matter it, where it comes from, but also giving them the, the ability to uh, tailor that to their own experiences to you know, remove a uh, OTT package when they don't see a need for it or don't, uh, or, or don't have access to it, or even indeed unsubscribe from that direct from the user experience itself. So it, it, it's um, the, the user experience is a key part of having the ability to continue to have the consumer engage with the content that they love, no matter where it comes from. Great. I mean, yeah, it's yeah, surfacing the content. It's obviously absolutely crucial. And as you say, with that cost element as well, it's getting the directing consumers to content that they can get from the most appropriate source that they don't have to pay extra for as well. I think that, that's obviously a key element of the, of the whole proposition, isn't it? One of the things that we found doing the work that we do is that uh, what is highly impactful for a consumer often is what is free to me you know what have i potentially already paid for or already have access to somewhere in a catalog somewhere uh, and uh, and that is incredibly powerful when you can bring those kind of things out of uh, and, and really find the the kind of diamond in the rough to a certain extent right and those are really the elements that make a really compelling uh, discovery experience absolutely Okay. Um, so we know what they should do. What are the challenges that stand in the way of them getting there, of service providers delivering this? And, and how would you measure their success in, in getting it right? The challenges are significant. I mentioned, you know, the technicality of the challenges uh, that is not insignificant, um, but, uh, but also one that uh, is not... Uh, it, it, I would describe it as not the um, longest pole in the tent, as it were. 
Um, so there is the technical challenge of building all of that infrastructure of being able to ingest that metadata, rationalize and match the metadata, and then provide it through a, a, a great consumer experience to the to the to the subscriber. Um, the big challenge in in my mind is all of the business agreements that you really need to be able to do to be able to uh, have access to the content that those consumers care about. We're seeing new OTT services come online, at least inside of 2020, it seems like one a week, and uh, each have new and exclusive content, and the content is good. And so, uh, you know, you need to be able to be, uh, you need to uh, have access to that content earlier on, you, you need to be able to ingest that content as fast as possible. And generally, you need to make that available for consumers on day one that those kind of OTT services drop. So having that continuous capability to uh, continue to bring in brand new content, uh, continue to bring in uh, or do all the maintenance and, uh, and upgrade around the, those pieces of content and work with those providers to, to make sure that they're um, their requirements and their feelings are understood and um, and and enabled is an, a not insignificant amount of work. Uh, something that we actually spend, you know, a significant period of, of people's time and and a team of folks, uh, at least on on our side, take care of those kind of relationships that that we have with uh, all of the OTT providers that I've mentioned and and many more besides. Great, and, and you know when you're you're talking around this, I think, um, the, one of the things that that really comes across is that there's so much content out there. There's so many different tiers to that content, so many different tariffs, so many different ways to pay for it, so many different elements that there's a, a tremendous amount to to push in front of the consumer and in a way that, that kind of makes sense for them. I mean, it's really, if it, you know, if a single streaming service is complex, an aggregated service is even more complex. So what for you then are the other elements of this super aggregation play that, that really come in play here and are key? And, and what other features do uh, the service providers really need to incorporate to, to accommodate all of this? Yeah, you, you, you make a, a, a very good point, um, which is a, really around those capabilities of once you have all of that information how do you how do you make most sense of it and how do you provide it to the consumer in the in the best way um you know we haven't we haven't really in this uh, discussion talked around you know how you entitle users how you make uh you know how you make sure that, that you're you're doing for the, the right thing for the right user at the right time um how you make sure that it turns up on um on one set top box for one account um, but doesn't turn up on a on a different set top box, maybe even in the same account. Maybe there's uh, different tiers even in the same account. Um, those are the kind of things that, uh, quite honestly, we leverage uh, the cloud capabilities that we have to leverage to be able to do. Um, so it requires, in often cases, a massive amount of computing, um, a massive amount of data, uh, especially when you're handling millions of set top boxes, and um, that is something that the, the cloud enables us to answer those kind of questions quickly, easily, and, and straightforward. Um, so it is uh, not an insignificant part of the overall um, uh, proposition that you need to be able to handle a super aggregated experience, um, but it is, and it is very much supported by the cloud uh, that, we, that we have access to in the back end. Great. So let, drawing to a close, Liam, finally, for you, how do we measure the success or the failure of, of super aggregation as a strategy for, for a service provider? What for you is, is, is the, the, the kind of measure of success? Right. Sure. I, I will, um, in typical uh, product management fashion, we have, uh, you know, more KPIs than we can, we can think about uh, and lots of ways to track them. Um, it, the the answer to your question actually is is very much baked in one of the uh, uh, tier one KPIs that we really think about, and that is time to content. You know, how much time do I spend sifting through the UI looking for something watch versus getting back to that content and being able to watch it? Um, lower is of course better. We we generally measure it in seconds. Um, candidly, uh, it, this is something that we've in the past seen 
multiple minutes. Uh, and, and I'm sure that bears out uh, and is something familiar to anyone that's used any of these kind of services that you can sit there for minutes at a time uh, looking for content, sometimes tens of minutes. We are uh, actively working and uh, have worked in the past on bringing that down. Um, I'm pleased to say we're under multiple minutes now and uh, we're actually into single digit minutes. So we're, we're into seconds. Um, and what we believe is that the consumer will tolerate and, and generally has a good consumer experience around a high number of, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe 50, 60 seconds uh, at the most. Uh, and we believe that that is our, our key to success in that, uh, you know, we, we spend such a large amount of our time focused on how quickly you can get back to content. Great, and I think that's, that's a good point to draw the discussion to, to a close. Um, thanks, Julian. That's fascinating stuff and some really interesting data points you, you, you brought in there as well. So um, I'd like to remind you that you can pose questions to, to Liam and he will get back to you uh, later with answers to those. Um, I'd like to thank um, Liam Bresnahan and Kedra Mohite for uh, outstanding contributions to today's event. And we'd like to thank TiVo for sponsoring the event and you, the audience, for attending. And on behalf of Digital TV Europe, have a great remainder of your day. Thanks very much. Thank you.